Mahaba and welcome to Guild Wars 2 Daily. Today we're going to be talking about lore. The footage in the background is again from Ultimesk. I'm gonna, I think I'm going to start doubling up on people at this point because uh, the list is slowly getting a little bit short. I may as well ask again, I'm not going to bog down too many videos asking, may as well ask again if anyone does have any footage that they'd like to be on Guild Wars 2 Daily, maybe get a bit of traffic for you, please just let me know and I'll continue adding people to the list as we go along. Uh, but yeah, Ultimesk again today, not World vs. World this time, some PvP stuff. I'll probably pick the video called Necro Vampire. <laughs> which sounds brilliant, so expect some necromancer play there. And yeah, let's just get stuck in. Today we're going to be talking about lore. Again, instead of Q&A though, I thought I could talk about a few other small stories or things that I know about in the Guild Wars universe that people might miss or not appreciate. The funny thing about Q&A is people actually have to ask about a specific topic in the first place for me to elaborate on it and maybe tell you something you didn't already know about. And what that means is some of the more obscure, interesting little things in Guild Wars 1 are probably never going to be asked about or mentioned, either because the actual topic itself is quite a simple one, it's just a cool, interesting thing, or because people just don't know about it. So I thought, what could I do here? And I've decided I'm going to go with a collection of small stories and events and things that I know happen in the Guild Wars universe that are quite dark and a lot of people might not be aware that they actually exist there in the game because I really like these dark stories with Guild Wars. I've always kind of wanted the game to explore more with the really kind of dark and adult plots I suppose you could say that they tend to shy away with in games like this because obviously you can't do it on a wide scale because then you're going to push up the age rating and it's important you know MMOs are accessible to a lot of people if you want them to flourish so Guild Wars especially as later campaigns came out and the expansion Eye of the North you can see a lot of that darker stuff does end up just kind of going away a little bit but there are small bits and small threads around in the lore as we established quite recently when we did that spotlight on the Celestials uh, there are still things littered around there that are quite you know know heavy material shall we say so for example in that spotlight I won't do this story again but there was the the story of the guy that watched all of his family be killed in front of himself and then he took it to on himself to try and fight back after seeing like his wife and his family be slaughtered you know that's quite that's quite dark that's quite deep and that is there in the Guild Wars universe so I thought I would just I've written down a very brief little list here of things that I know affected me in some way while I was playing the game that you might have missed I doubt you will know all of these. If you do know all of these, then congratulations, you're a pretty big lore nerd. And uh, yeah, I'm just going to work my way down the list. I have just looked over though, one thing before we start that, there's going to be an Ask Me Anything on Reddit with Mike O'Brien. It will be starting about 20 minutes from the time when I start filming Guild Wars 2 Daily, so it'll be going on, definitely. I, I may have even finished by the time this video goes up, so you should check that out. I'm sure there'll be a link around there somewhere. This guy is one of the founders of ArenaNet, so he's like, he's the top dog. There were three founders originally, two of them have left now, and he's kind of the last one left so he's really really up there and if you've got any questions for him then he's certainly a very cool guy to speak to he was one of the ex blizzard employees as well i know a lot of people like to mention that about arena net that it was founded by ex blizzard employees this guy wrote a lot of the coding for battle.net and the networking code for diablo and starcraft and all kinds of stuff like that so yeah he, he was a blizzard for a long time he's a very very cool interesting guy and uh, as i say and ask me anything on reddit but anyway law right so law i'm just going to work my way down the list that i've written here in no particular order the first interesting quite dark story I think that people could tend to miss out on is the story of Althea in Ascalon. Now, this has been on my mind a little bit because of obviously the next summary episode that will be coming out soon, in which I actually talk about this story a little bit there too. Uh, basically, the plot is this. King Adelburn, the king of Ascalon as we knew it in Guild Wars 1's time, he wasn't actually of royal blood at all. Uh, the actual successor to the throne should have been a man named Duke Baradin, who you can meet in-game. Uh, but Baradin never took the throne, either because he didn't want it for himself, or because he just fell out of popular favour. Adelburn got the throne despite the fact that he wasn't of royal blood because he was such a good soldier in the Guild Wars and he obviously was responsible for a lot of big victories during the Guild Wars for Ascalon. So he kind of rose to become the king and Baradin stepped away. And Baradin, as we knew him in Guild Wars 1, was kind of okay with that. There were royalists that were about in pre-searing Ascalon that you could fight against and they wanted Baradin to be back on the throne, but that never actually really happened. So Adelburn took it and he had his son Rurik, right? Now Rurik 
was due to be marrying Baradin's daughter, Lady Althea, this this woman called Althea. So the idea was, it seems, that the two houses were going to be joined back together and royal blood would come back into control of Ascalon, right? You know, if Rurik and Althea had a son, then obviously he would eventually be king and you'd have the royal blood back. So it seems like it was orchestrated on that level, but then there's obviously a story that Rurik and Althea were truly in love and they were betrothed with one another. And in pre Young Ascalon, uh, a lot of the talk that you hear from a lot of the NPCs and what a few of the quests are about are uh, this wedding. The wedding is due between these two people, these two characters. It's due to be happening and you're going around trying to get a gift for them and it's just all wonderful and very happy and a perfect story. And then obviously the searing hits. The child come out of nowhere, they destroy all of Ascalon and the searing hits. And at that point in the game it jumps forwards two years. You don't actually get to see that two year gap that happens there. And when you get back into the world a lot's changed. The wedding never happened in the end, so that all the plans were cancelled, but obviously they were tr still trying to make a go of it. However, you find out that Althea was kidnapped by the Char, so this woman was just totally kidnapped by them. So Adelburn basically sits down and says to Baradin, look, you need to go out there and try and find Althea. She's your daughter, so Baradin was obviously more than happy to do it, and he took a few of his men out beyond the wall into Char-held territory to try and rescue his daughter and try and save his daughter, and they, they went right out into this really dangerous place. They went to Pekin Square that's pretty much just surrounded by Char. And there are all these quests that you can do there at Pekin Square, speaking to Baradin, who's very distraught, obviously, about his daughter that's missing, and obviously Rurik would be in the same situation. And you do these quests, and instead of it just being a typical storyline where you'd go out, you'd find Althea, and then you'd bring her back, and then everyone would live happily ever after, you actually get there and find that she's been killed by the Char, which is pretty left field immediately from there. All of a sudden, this is become quite a tragic story about, you know, this woman and this man that never ended up getting married. But not just killed, but they go as far as to mention that the char burned her alive as essentially like a statement, I suppose, to Rurik. And it like deals a serious blow to him. And I, I kind of like to see the plot as this is one of the things that really pushes Rurik closer to the edge. And then obviously there's all that tension between him and his father and he gets exiled in the end. So really that's quite a dark thing that happens in the early Ascalon storyline, this whole thing of Rurik loving this woman and the, the marriage never ends up happening, and the father actually ends up seeing his daughter burned alive at the hands of the Char. So these were some of the early things that were happening in prophecies that really made you hate the Char, which uh, is quite interesting because little bits of lore like that I'm, I'm pretty sure ArenaNet won't want to remind players about now that we can play the Char. Though I think that, you know, if you want to be a Char, then that should be something you kind of are proud of. That's what your race did, and I think that's quite cool that the Char was so evil and so malicious there and did something like that. And it's just a, a pretty cool little thing that's there in the lore that really strikes me as quite dark and is pretty early on as well. It's just hard to notice because it's through lots of different quests that you have to piece together for yourself. Uh, the main dark lore that always strikes out for me when people say, oh, what's the darkest, I suppose, that the Guild Wars has ever been, I always point to the bleached bones of the Crystal Desert. We did another spotlight recently, which is also what got me thinking about this, on uh, Chirai Osa and this tragic story of this hero of the the nation that founded the Order of Whispers. You know, the Order of Whispers are, are a huge group of heroes and you can be joining them in Guild Wars 2, but when you look at it, they were actually founded by this guy that fell from grace and was responsible for the death of many, many people. And that in itself is quite a tragic story. What I didn't tell you about in that spotlight is that you can actually go around the crystal desert where these people have died and you can find these interactive objects littered all over the place. And these are the bones of the people that have died there. And through whatever means, you, when you click these bones, you can get story about the people who, that they belong to. And you can find out kind of what was happening to them in their moments before death. And they can be really really dark and it's pretty fantastic. I'll read just a couple of examples out for you guys because there are a hell of a lot of these stories and all of them are really pretty bad. So for example these are the bones of a man that's died in the desert and you read his bones and, and you get a message from him that says why did we come out here? My daughters have grown sicker each day and nothing I can do will save them. At night I see the gleaming eyes of creatures that wait just outside the firelight for me to fall to asleep so they can feed on my little ones. Their mother dead these last two weeks will curse me from her shallow grave but I have no choice. Tonight the soup will contain enough choke root to put the girls to sleep for once and for all. When they are safe once again I will eat of it myself for I'll not face the morning without them. So here we've got established this father that's wife has died a while ago and he's scared that his daughters are going to be eaten alive so he poisons his own children and then poisons himself 
during the night because he knows that there are monsters nearby that are going to eat them anyway. I mean, uh, that's just so, so dark. And that specific quote actually is a part of a, a quest line that was introduced way later in Nightfall that expanded on this. And you actually got to go speak to the mother and find out what happened. And you actually get to go to her as she's a ghost and she'll find out and she'll be very upset about what the father did. But eventually she'll kind of understand why he had to do it. I mean, that's really, really dark. Um, there's some more interesting ones here actually in the Crystal Desert. That's not the only one. There are loads. This one's quite nice with some description to do with this guy's eyes. Uh, I have walked for three days without food, two without water. I can no longer remember what it was I thought to accomplish coming to this God's forsaken place, only that my pride has cost me everything I loved and will ultimately cost me my life. My skin is burned, my lips are cracked and have adhered to my teeth so that I can no longer close my mouth. My eyes are but two pebbles that scrape against my eyelids when I blink. Today I close them for good. To whomever who reads this, leave the desert and go back to your home. Nothing you left behind can be more deadly than this place. What I liked about the idea of doing this video was that we talk a lot on Guild of Cedalion with the lore stuff about the massive big sweeping changes and huge massive ideas and concepts about the gods and the dragons and the expansions and stuff. I think what's missing actually very slightly is that this is a game about characters and actual people people that are living in the world and how the people are impacted, right? And this is some of the best way to actually look at that. Good writing in the game, you actually have to be compelled by the characters that are in it, and in some ways I actually think it's a shame that there are these really well written things in the Guild Wars universe, for Guild Wars 1 at least, that never really you got to see in the main characters. I mean, you really feel, do you not feel for this guy that's just dying out here in the desert? I do. So I, I think it's quite nice to actually ground it back there because I ignore this kind of stuff quite a lot, and that is a really big part of the Guild Wars universe, and uh, I'd like to see more of it as well. I think the only reason more people aren't already into the lore before they start hearing a lot of it from someone like me is because the actual characters and stuff doesn't compel them immediately. That's what's missing at the moment. The lore itself is sound, but the way it's being delivered to people, especially in Guild Wars 1, wasn't fantastic. Uh, one more quote from these before we'll move on to the next thing. Uh, the creatures are coming. I hear the clicking of their claws drawing near in the darkness. It's all I can do to keep from screaming and alerting them to my location. I don't know why I even continue to write. I suppose I'm comforted by the thought that someone someday might tell my family what finally became of me. I'm sorry, mother, I should have listened to you. And, you know, just the regrets of people that are about to die. It's, it's, it's brilliant. I love it. I love all these bleach bones. They're so good. They're such a massive, awesome bit of dark Guild Wars lore that just isn't there in the main storyline. You have to go out and look for this. Uh, two other things. I'll try and be a little bit quicker with these. Um, one, actually, that I can be very quick on, actually, is uh, the character Yijo Tan in Canther in Early Factions is a tragic tragic story that people miss out on because it was so poorly put into the game that it was too, too easy to miss this character. So, Faction starts with you being a new joiner to Xingjie Monastery, where you seek to learn to become a better fighter, essentially. Or you seek to learn your profession a bit better, right? And uh, as you join in the lore, there are actually other characters that join alongside you. One of these characters is called Yijou Tan, and it becomes very clear very quickly if you know where to look at the right moments of the right quests and be in the right areas without progressing in certain places. Um, um, you can actually get dialogue with this Yijo Tan guy that's popping up, and it becomes quite clear that he's like the personal favourite of Master Togo. Master Togo, as you might know, is the character you spend a lot of time with in factions. Really, you become his favourite eventually. You're Master Togo's favourite, but that's not how it originally was. Yijo Tan was the most promising looking student that was there at the monastery, and he was the one that Togo took such a shining to, and he was the one that seemed destined for great things off in the future. He was basically what you, the hero, would have been. But, however, that was never meant to be. He was this character that was in the background that was there every now and then, and you'll find that he's the one teaching you in the tutorial areas and everything, and he's kind of this character that you start to look up to, or maybe even be slightly jealous of because of how kind of good he is at the monastery. But the story of factions, of course, is about the affliction and the plague, right? And people becoming sick and people becoming afflicted. And they really do it in a very unceremonial way that a lot of people wouldn't notice. But on the final mission of the first section of factions, when you're about to leave Xingjie Island, uh, in the final mission, you go to this temple that this great afflictions broke out at and there's loads of afflicted everywhere. And um, what you might not realize, and a lot of people don't figure out, is that one of the bosses that you're fighting there is Yizhou Tan. Yizhou Tan succumbs, he dies. He dies to the affliction, he becomes afflicted, he becomes like the Guild Wars zombie and it's your job to kill this student that was supposed to mean so much. In the lore, Master Togo actually sent him out ahead because he trusted him but Master Togo actually in a way sent him to his 
death. And then you come forward and you have to clean up the pieces and you end up killing Yijo Tan once he's become afflicted and you have to step into his shoes and you become like Togo's new favourite. The way I've just described that probably makes Togo sound really kind of bad for being responsible for Yijo's death. And in a way he is, which is also what I quite like about the story that just makes it slightly more tragic. It's this cool character that's there and he dies and he was supposed to be, it seemed, so much more and then he's just gone and dead. It's really, this really cool story that could have meant a lot but because it was so poorly executed in the game, people miss out on it even existing, which is a shame. The last one, uh, you'll notice all of these little stories are a little bit obscure. The last one that I can talk about before we kind of run on too long is the story of the Scarab Plague in Nightfall. This was another really kind of dark thing when you think about it. So this was something that happened a long time ago before even Nightfall came out. It's kind of deep Elona history, right? It's the story of this plague that you hear about that essentially wiped everyone out on that continent. Just, it, people died. Massively, massively died. This huge plague broke out and then the plague mysteriously vanished by the way uh, there's this bit in the lore of the Scarab Plague where we don't know why the plague started and we don't know why it randomly ended either that's actually some unanswered questions in the lore that they established in Nightfall that I'm expecting will hopefully be answered in Guild Wars 2 it's actually quite interesting why did the plague come and why did it suddenly disappear they put a lot of emphasis on that why has it disappeared they even suggest that there was some kind of magical influence or something that caused it to disappear but deliberately don't tell us it's definitely set up as one of these mysteries but anyway this plague itself you hear kind of exists and that's about that but there is a side quest you can play in early nightfall that if you do it you learn a lot more about it you find out it's not a plague as in just something you know a sickness like you'd expect from you know what we kind of saw with guild wars factions minus the obviously the, the whole zombie aspect of it and it wasn't like a plague that you'd expect from like the real world like the bubonic plague or anything it was nothing like that granted when you do hear about it in small snippets just from playing through nightfall that's the impression you get of it but when you do this side quest you learn that this plague that had afflicted everyone was actually distributed to people through the food that they were eating. Turns out that the food they were eating had eggs of tiny little insects. This is called the scarab plague and these tiny little insects would get, go on to live inside people essentially like parasites and start to eat them from inside out and there's this fantastic description okay here of what specifically these insects were doing inside your body and how they found out that it was the insects later on where you you hear about the corpse of one of these guys and what happened to their bones. Um Remains found in the ruins support the claim that insects tore the victim's flesh from within as the cracked bones were bent and bore spherical indentations, suggesting the creatures were scarabs, hence the name of the plague. That's just straight from Wiki, and you get that through the quotes of the story. So these were insects that were living inside people's bodies and not just kind of chewing through the flesh and eating them on the inside out, as you might expect there, but they were actually eating through the people's bones. It sounds terrible it sounds like such torture and it's just a really really dark idea for this plague that had afflicted all these people and pretty much wiped out the population of humanity almost in Elona all those years ago and it was just these, these scarabs just like going through the air their little eggs being blown through the air and getting inside people from eating them and consuming them and then basically eating their way back outside fantastic story I, I mean the imagination to come up with that is really really quite cool and uh, it's one of those things that people look over with the scarab plague it actually sounds really quite scary. Uh, one thing I wanted to end this video on, like, this has gone way too long, but one thing I wanted to end this kind of lore thing on was that you would expect a lot of this lore to, this dark lore, me to start going on about the realm of torment and stuff, and you know, all these things that Abaddon wanted to do, because really Nightfall, if you think about it, is like going to hell or you might expect something like the Underworld lore that's there in the Underworld or the Fissure of Woe or something, you, you, you might expect that to be some of the most dark lore, and you can see traces of that in there, for example, the Titans these are horrible creatures full of malice and hate, but actually the lore is, these were people that were just tormented tortured, died, and then their spirits continued to be tortured for ages and ages and ages in the foundry of failed creation until they were just warped to a point where they were completely unrecognisable, these just things filled with malice and hate because of all the torture that they'd gone through, which is quite dark, but really even though you go to this hellish place and there's all this talk about the end of the world and stuff, it doesn't feel as dark to me as some of these smaller bits of lore where you just piece together and you actually get to 
really experience what it's like for the people going through it. I mean, the Bleach Bones, for example, when Nightfall came out, they even eventually had to change the name of some NPCs that were called, like, tortured prisoners and stuff because someone complained. And that's just an example, but it does show that further on, as they went through Nightfall in particular and then Eye of the North, ArenaNet really did stop with this more dark stuff and it's a lot harder to find it. I can't really think of anything in Eye of the North that was really, really quite moving in any way. Uh, it's really some of the earliest stuff that they wrote and I, I just kind of wanted to do this video to express that I, I really like that kind of story and I hope that that doesn't continue with Guild Wars 2. I do hope that, you know, in general fine, have it a very PG game. That, that's fine, you can do that. But I also would like to still see in, in nooks and crannies of the game some really good stuff that makes you think and actually makes you consider what the people in this world are living like because I just think that makes the whole experience so much more fun and immersive and, and cool. So uh, yeah, there you go guys. That's some of my favourite dark lore from Inside Guild Wars. There's certainly a hell of a lot more. These were just kind of the first things that came to my mind. Maybe we'll go back to it someday. I hope you enjoyed this instead of Q&A today. We will continue to do Q&A though. Don't worry about that. Once again, the Reddit AMA, if you're interested, it will probably be finished or still going on right now. So uh, go check that out on Reddit. And uh, yeah, thanks again, guys. I guess I will see you tomorrow for mechanics or whatever we're going to be doing tomorrow. So, yeah, see you later, everyone.